All right, praise God, everybody. During the holiday season, uh, it's easy to lose focus, and we don't want to do that. In fact, uh, I mentioned uh, last week that, I don't know if it was a Wednesday or Sunday, but I mentioned in regard to holidays that uh, you want to make sure if you're celebrating holidays, you're able to be Christ-focused, amen? And that's, that's a huge key. Uh, you know, the Bible talks, I even gave exa- said there's examples of the Old Testament. I did a message one time on holidays, and I pointed out in the Old Testament, there's holidays that God ordained, a few specifically where they, all the males had to go to Jerusalem three times a year. So three times a year, you made a long trip. If you were, say, in Galilee or up north or elsewhere in Israel, you made a trip to uh, the temple, and you'd have three celebrations a year. But besides that, there were other things that God had ordained, and there were things that God had not uh, ordained, Uh, specifically in his word, but he recounts, or it's recounted in his word uh, that they commemorated a certain event or a certain person's death because, you know, the people did. And that became something I said they would do every year. Uh, And God never condemned that. That wasn't considered a bad thing. So my point in that was that uh, Thanksgiving wasn't ordained in Scripture, but if we want to give thanks to God, you know, for, for our freedom and what have you, that's a good thing. Amen? So, uh, and I also point out that Hanukkah is not a God-ordained holiday in the Old Testament. It was an intertestamental development that's celebrated by Jews to this day regarding the Maccabean revolt and the, you know, the candles staying lit and what have you, the oil being preserved or without oil or what have you. Uh, pretty remarkable. However, Jesus went to Hanukkah and he pointed to himself as the light of the world. And I think that's a great balanced picture is unless you're adopting pagan practices and worshiping things that are pagan, if you're bowing down and worshiping something or doing things pagan, that's wrong. But if you can use something to point to Jesus, amen, to me that's the wise way to go about holidays. But what happens in the Christian community is people end up talking more about to their kids about Santa Claus and Easter bunnies and things like that to the point where kids are actually being led astray. I'm sorry. It's happening. I mean, uh, and it could be devastating when they find out later. In fact, Sue Lee, who I just uh, gave a hug to earlier, I remember she told me a story where she was taught about, you know, uh, even though she was brought up in a Christian home, father being a pastor, great man, but just the tradition, you know, Santa and what have you. And, and then she was taught that uh, uh, Santa was real. And so what happens is, and I'm not sure this happened in her life, but your focus gets into being good for Santa, you know, and he's coming back, you know, he's going to reward you for what's, and what happened, she said, when she found out that Santa wasn't real, it devastated her, and it made her question whether Jesus was real. It became a devastating thing, she said. Am I, is that right? That was years ago you told me that. I got a thumbs up. I just let you know, you guys, the Bible says speak truth. What's that? Last year, right. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, Suli. <laughs> So when she was 28, you know, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> it was probably about, well, it was a while ago when she told me. Uh, but you know what? We need to speak the truth to our kids about why, you know what I'm saying? About things and focus on Jesus, amen? So I'm t- saying this time of year, make sure your, your focus is Christ-focused. And Peter certainly draws our attention to being Christ-focused in First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be looking at the last couple of verses, keeping in mind the context, much of the context of 1 Peter is how to live a Christian life during times of, of suffering, during hard times, during times of persecution. And there's so much practical wisdom just how to live the Christian life in general as well. But it's highlighted under the uh, construct of a persecuted people, the early church who were scattered about, Gentiles and Jews who were scattered throughout the Roman Empire, who were on the verge of uh, the, the Nero's persecution, losing their heads. In fact, Peter would end up being put to death, crucified upside down. Paul would lose his head, uh, and we read about that in Scripture where he talks about his death was impending and what have you when he was in prison there in Timothy, Second Timothy. Uh, but you know what? The persecution would increase, and in certain parts of the world, uh, there's more people being put to death now uh, I mean, you would be inclu- you would be amazed if you realize how many people are losing their lives for Christ in in Islamic nations. Sometimes reported, sometimes not reported. Uh, not all Islamic nations, but 
some Islamic nations, uh, persecuted radically, not able to share the gospel, or imprisoned uh, in China, what have you, in places like that. Uh, here in America, we go through persecution. Our, and you will be persecuted to one degree or another. I mean, it's amazing. The name of Jesus. Jesus said you'll be hated by all nations because of my namesake, right? But, you know, if you're at work, you could talk about Buddha. You could talk about New Age, you know, crystals and putting pyramids on your heads and all kinds of bizarre stuff. And you talk about psychobabble and, you know, all kinds of rebirthing, all kinds of weird, bizarre things. But you bring up the name of Jesus and say, say what Jesus thinks about this, that, or the other. At the very least, you'll get raised eyebrows. Because he's real, guys. Because he demands to be followed. I remember uh, Francis Chan, who was uh, promoting our video, they sold their souls for rock and roll, and he said that uh, what amazed him through the video was all these rock bands, they weren't attacking Buddha. They weren't attacking, you know, Muhammad. They were all attacking Jesus. He said that shows there's something really going on, you know. And it's so true. And I'll tell you what. We will be persecuted and to one degree or another. But I'll tell you what, if we can't stand the persecution now, how can we stand it later? I mean, we're not being persecuted like many of our brethren are throughout the world. You might get called a name or made fun of or called a Jesus freak or whatever. That's nothing compared to people that are losing their loved ones, people that are losing their own, that are being tortured for Christ, uh, people that are being beheaded or you know, radically for Jesus. So, and the Bible says, in one of my favorite verses along these lines about making sure you're prepared, it says, God tells Jeremiah, who started to cower under just the smaller amount of persecution, which was more than what we typically go through, uh, and later on, he's going to be, you know, really go through some radical things. And he says, if you, God says to him, if you can't run with the foot soldiers, meaning when you're just doing that kind of, you know, getting persecuted by the foot soldiers, how are you going to stand when the chariots come in the thickets? when it gets really thick, when it gets really deep, when it gets really powerful. So the thing is, is God uses things we go through now, thank him when you go through trials, because he prepares us for things that could eventually happen in the future that are far more intense. And I say could, because we don't know when uh, what will break out. There's times of, even in the early church, we talk about the first three centuries of church history where there were 10 waves of radical persecution. And there were different types of persecution, 10 ways under different emperors, from Nero to Domitian and on and on. But there were also times during the church fathers, you can read the church fathers, you can see when they're under persecution. Some of them are named like Justin Martyr because he was martyred, one of the church fathers. But there's other times when they're writing where they're enjoying, at least in their provinces or maybe even the Roman Empire for, at certain times, under certain emperors, it was true, there was relative peace as well. So uh, we don't know, you know, uh, and I'm not even talking about the tribulation right at this point. That's something to be concerned about, too, and always be prepared for. But Jesus said, in the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So Peter writes us to, and he says in 1 Peter 4, when arm yourselves to suffer. That's the backdrop. And then he gives Jesus as an example of one that didn't revile back when he was persecuted, when he was reviled. And Jesus had a purpose in dying for us. Obviously, Jesus said he could have called 12 leaders of angels to save him. Amen. But why did Jesus die? To save us from our sins. But we see in our text, it was beyond that as well. First uh, Peter chapter 2. And let's go ahead and just uh, read verses. The verses prior to 24 and 25 talk about him as our example, giving us an example. But I want to hone in on verses 24 and 25. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. For you were continually strained like sheep. But now you have returned to the shepherd and guardian of your souls. I want to go through and finish First Peter chapter 2 this morning together. And I want to talk about Jesus as our sin bearer. And we've been talking about the example he's left and suffering and what have you. But Peter here you know, emphasizes the fact that he bore our sins on the cross in his body and that he is the guardian of our souls. And it's important to understand and appreciate. I mean, what did we sing about this morning? I mean, how many songs did we sing about the cross? I think it's just about everyone was about the cross. Most of them mentioned the cross, you know. 
And I praise God for the cross. It's because it's at the cross. That's where, where Jesus paid for our sins. That became an altar. In fact, I remember, you know, sometimes you'll get a knock at the door and it'll be, you know, cultists, you know, those who don't adhere to orthodox biblical Christianity. They typically have extra books. They said that God gave them, like Islam says the Quran, you know, they don't typically go to the door or, you know, uh, or they have magazines that we need these magazines, you know, the Watchtower magazines, you know, uh, the Awake magazines. And the Watchtower movement said that you, without the Bible and just having those magazines, you'll have the light. But if you just have the Bible, you don't have our magazines, you'll be in darkness after two years. That's from the Watchtower. That's a sign of a cult, guys, okay? And I noticed that cults typically shun Jesus in regard to who he is as God, and they de-emphasize him as being God. They often de-emphasize the born-again experience. They often de-emphasize an actual relationship with Jesus. You hardly ever see a cult member say, praise Jesus or praise the Lord. I've been around them. I've gone to the Kingdom Hall. I've gone to stakes. I've gone to different places. You don't see like a relationship where people are, praise the Lord. Where I'm around my brothers and sisters, it just comes natural. Because the Holy Spirit, you know, and the relationship we have with the Father and being born again, the emphasis on being born again. But you also don't go to get an emphasis on the cross, I noticed. No cross on their buildings or... And it's interesting. And I had one cult member when I was a new Christian, when I was asking them why they didn't use the cross. I was pretty green. I was pretty new. I didn't know any Christians. I was the only Christian I knew. You know, I'm knocking on my door. I said, why don't you guys use the cross? And the guy was like, if somebody killed your dad with a sword, would you hang that sword up on your wall? And he made me think. But the more I thought, I thought, if my dad took that sword for me, you know, it has a totally different meaning in, in his sacrifice. And I thought it's interesting because the Bible doesn't view the cross that way. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. In fact, in Philippians, it talks about those who are against the cross as enemies of the cross. And in Galatians chapter 6, Paul says if he's going to glory in anything, he's going to glory in the cross. That's why we sing about what Jesus did on the cross, man. That's be we have eternal life, redemption through his sacrifice. Amen? What a beautiful symbol. By the way, uh, the cross, I mean, you go to cat the catacombs in Rome, uh, you can look at the earliest tombs of Christians in the early centuries. In fact, I saw, uh, I saw film, or I should say slides, back in the days of slides, of a, a, a Jewish archaeologist who became a Christian. His father was actually uh, the top archaeologist at the Hebrew University there in Jerusalem. And he became a Christian. And he showed us slides of first century tombs of Christians with Jesus who is God, Jesus who ascended. First century tombs. And guess what you saw? Crosses. The early Christians used the cross. Now, uh, so we praise God for the cross and what Jesus did on it, but it's not the cross itself. It's what Jesus, when we talk about the cross, we're talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. Amen? That's what we're talking about when we sing about the cross. We're not singing about two pieces of wood that cross each other. We're talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. And they do have an example, by the way. The only person that they have an example of that's been fossilized, so to speak, is bones of somebody who was uh, crucified by the Romans. That by the nature of their wounds, uh, experts have said that it was an actual cross, not just a mere stake. But if, whether, even if it was a stake or a cross, it's what he did. It's not the configuration, although I think the configuration is quite interesting for other reasons I won't get into at this point. But it says that Jesus, in verse 24... And he himself bore our sins. He, he bore our sins in his body on the cross. You and I, we have a ton of sin that we should be condemned for, that we should be separated from God for eternity for because of our sin. All of us have sin. All of us have guilt of sin. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one of us is righteous or perfect before God. We all have sin, and it needs to be taken care of. If, if we're going to be right with God, we need to be forgiven. And God doesn't have to forgive us. It was his sovereign choice. He could have just condemned us. Amen? Jesus didn't die for angels. 
And so the cross and what Jesus did is something that we should be very, very thankful for because we would not have eternal life. We would have no hope in the, for the future. Our lives would be incredibly dreadful because all we would have is a bleak, Christless, eternal, separated future in hell from God if it wasn't for the cross, if it wasn't for what Jesus did on the cross. And it says he bore up. He bore our sins. The word is bear up. Anaphero is a Greek word. And it's an interesting Greek word because it literally means to, you know, to offer up or to bear up. But it's usage in the Septuagint or the LXX, which is the Greek translation that the Jews had made of the Old Testament. It's used over and over again of bearing up offerings or sacrifices to God like the animal sacrifice. It's used 25 times in the book of Leviticus alone of offering up sacrifices. So Peter is alluding to, and the Septuagint was used in those days. In fact, the apostles and Jesus himself quoted from the Septuagint because the Greek was the common language of the day, and they quoted that translation often, and that would have been a known word for sacrifices, and it's used of Jesus. So I believe Peter here is alluding to uh, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament being fulfilled in Jesus. And on a far, Pharaoh means to take up and bear sins by imputation. That means to uh, take the responsibility or the blame of another upon yourself. Take, take their punishment. And imputation is an interesting word. And it says in, in Romans chapter Three, uh, well, there's other there's scriptures that talk about, like in Romans 4 and what have you, that God's, you know, and, and in Galatians and what have you, that and 1 Corinthians 1, that we become the righteousness of God. See, our sins were credited to Jesus, and his righteousness is credited to us. I was explaining to my son, when I was explaining some theological terms to him uh, recently, one of them that we talked about was imputation. And it means to be like credited, and I said, for instance, Josiah, without Jesus, if the Lord went to our spiritual bank account, we would not just be at zero, we would be in the negative. We would owe him a lot. We'd be in trouble. We'd be, we're spiritually bankrupt. But Jesus took our sin, that lack of credit, in fact, that debt, the sin debt was put upon him on the cross. He became sin, not an actual sinner, but the bearer of sin for us, that we might become what? The righteousness of God. Do you understand? So our sin was imputed to who? To Jesus. His righteousness, he, it says in 1 Corinthians 1 that he is our righteousness. His righteousness was what? Credited or imputed to us. Amen? That's, the, that's what the Bible teaches in regard to imputation. And it is a biblical teaching. In fact, Peter makes it really clear that Jesus bore our sins. He bore our sins, guys. And that's huge, and that, that's incredibly uh, beautiful. And it's interesting because Jesus is our great high priest. And in the Old Testament, it would talk about how the high priest would bear up out of Pharaoh, you know, the sacrifices. Now, the high priest wasn't sacrificing himself, though. He was bearing up the what? The animal sacrifices. And it's important to understand that because he couldn't die for our sins. He was a man like you and me. You can't die for my sins. I can't die for your sins because we're sinners. But he would offer up them. But Jesus offered up, he's, now it's important, he offered up what? Himself for our sins. He offered up himself for our sins. Not mere animal. Well, then why the animals? Because all the lambs, the sheep, the, the, the doves, the, the goats, all these animal sacrifices were there so God would make people aware that there's a huge problem with mankind. Our big problem is sin, and it's huge, and it sinks to high heaven. And the animal sacrifices would simply cover sin. They didn't take it away. They covered it. They put it on hold. God's dealing with it on hold. In other words, God could have just wiped us out. But when Jesus came, he didn't just cover it. I look at it like the trash man, you know. Jesus took our sin. You know, we cover our trash, right? Right? It deals with it to a degree, but it doesn't really get rid of it, huh? And, I, and the more time it's covered and the longer it takes, the more it stinks, but it's still trying to cover it. But the trash man, what does he do? He takes it away. Jesus, Lamb of God, who what? Takes away our sins. However, he's not the trash man. He's the Lamb of God who bore our trash. Amen? He's a perfect, innocent Lamb of God. We're, we're the trash, our sins and what have you. And Jesus bore our sin for us. 
So it's amazing. So Peter basically uses the cross. He bore our sins on the cross. And the word anaphero has to do with lifting up. And the reason that word was used in the Old Testament for animal sacrifice is because they would lift them up on an altar which was elevated. Understand? The cross becomes what? The altar. The cross becomes the altar. And it's quite amazing when you, you think about it. Now, it's interesting Leviticus says of the high priest, and the high priest in the Old Testament was a picture. There was one high priest at a time. He's a picture of Jesus. And Aaron was the first high priest, and Aaron's sons shall offer, Moses wrote, by inspiration of God. Aaron's sons shall, and this is in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 5, Aaron's sons shall offer it up, and a pharaoh in the Septuagint, uh, uh, to bear or carry, in smoke on the altar of the burnt offering, which is on the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering by fire of a soothing aroma to the Lord. When Jesus went to the cross, those pictures were, were fulfilled. We think of his physical agony, but even greater, I believe, was his spiritual agony. Because we have, you know, the torment that we would have to go through for eternity, all of us, he himself bore. Now, it's interesting as well, because... Uh, the high priest was, well, the high priest, it says in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, does not need daily, does not need daily like those high priests, meaning the Jewish high priest, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people because this he did once for all when he offered up himself, Hebrews seven twenty-seven in the New Testament. What's he saying? Jesus doesn't have to daily sacrifice. Amen? They had to constantly do that because it never took away sin. But because when he died, he took away the sins of the world. Amen? And the point is, is that when Jesus died, God's wrath that is against all wickedness because he's righteous and a righteous judge, a righteous civilization punishes evil. If God is righteous, he punishes evil. But guess what? Because he loves us, he wants to spare us from eternal damnation. And therefore, his wrath is not satisfied through animal sacrifice because guess what? A cute little beautiful lamb is not equivalent to a human being. A lamb cannot be a substitute for you. It's just a lamb. You're the, you, you know, we're created a little bit lower than the angels. We're, we're created in the image of God. So if someone is going to take my place and give himself for me, and actually take away my sins, he has to be at least 100% equal to me, and perfectly righteous. But guess what? Let's say there was a perfectly righteous person without sin. Theoretically, maybe they could die for one person's sins, right? But not for what? Everybody's sins. Do you understand? Theoretically. I don't even think that, that can't even theoretically happen ultimately because we're all sinners. But guess what? Jesus paid the price for everybody's sins. How could he do that? Because he's the perfect man and because he's also who? He's God, amen? God in the flesh. Therefore, when he suffers, he suffers, he's infinite being. Therefore, when he suffers, he suffers in an infinite way for all of us. Therefore, his, his death is not limited. His atonement is not limited to a few. His death is sufficient for everyone because of the magnitude of who he is. Amen? Now, it's interesting because in Isaiah 53, in the Old Testament, and I said, this is a good part of the Scripture to just, if you're witnessing to Jewish friends, and we have uh, several Jewish believers here, but when you're witnessing to your Jewish friends, uh, what's a really cool thing to do is just print out Isaiah 53 on your computer. But don't say Isaiah 53 yet. And then have a Jewish friend read it and ask him just two questions. Who's this about and where's it from? And typically what answer you'll get is it's about Jesus. And it's from the New Testament. Right and wrong. It's about Jesus, yes. Number two, uh, wrong. It's from the Old Testament about how the Messiah would die for our sins. In fact, Isaiah 53 talks about how he would bear our sins in his body. It says uh, in Isaiah chapter 53, uh, verses 4 through 6, Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Now, before we go further, 
Uh, uh, read that further. Look again at chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were what? You were healed. Where is that from? By his wounds you were healed? Isaiah 53. Now let me read chapter, verse 25 of 1 Peter chapter 2 in the New Testament. For you were continually strained like sheep. Where's that from? That's from Isaiah 53 as well, guys. But now you have returned to the shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Peter quotes two different parts of Isaiah chapter 53 in the context of talking about how Jesus bore our sins. You guys, I love to use Isaiah 53. We had a study through uh, some of Isaiah 53 a year ago or so, and we went through a lot. The first study went through a lot of New Testament texts that quote from Isaiah 53. It's one of the most quoted Old Testament passages in all of the New Testament. And if the Holy Spirit uses it often to show what Jesus did, I think we are wise to use it often when we share with people. Amen. And here Peter uses it. And keep in mind, when they were bringing forth the new covenant and, and showing what Jesus had done, these Jews, they lived in the first century, and they were all, it wasn't as though there was a unified thought about who the Messiah would be. There were all kinds of different people, Jewish groups thinking all kinds of different things. I pointed that out before. A lot of times people say, oh, well, this is what the Jews believe. Wait a minute, which Jews? In the New Testament times, we, you know, we have the Essenes, we have the, the Zealots, we have the Pharisees, we have the Sadducees, we have the Herodians, we have the Hellenists. We have the Christians, which were all Jews originally. Yeah, well, all kinds of different groups with different messianic understandings. But guess why Christianity triumphed and, and grew so radically, so quickly, in the midst of great persecution by the Roman authorities? Because they could go to the Scripture and say, in Isaiah it says, or in Jeremiah it says there'd be a new covenant. Or thus saith the Lord, because that was a Scripture and people would see with their own eyes scriptures like this. Surely our griefs, Isaiah 53, verses 4 through 6. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, you know, our view of the Messiah would be that God was against him. He was afflicted because of something he had done. But he goes on to say right after that, the very next verse, but he was pierced through for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. That destroys the view of so many liberals in the church who want to just say Jesus died as just an example. It shows us that Jesus substituted himself for us, took the sins that we deserve very, very clearly. And Peter, that's Peter's interpretation of Isaiah chapter 53. And, not, and when I say liberals, I'm talking about those who pass themselves off often as evangelicals in the emergent church who scorn and call uh, and and you know, ridicule Jesus' sacrificial, substitutionary sacrifice. And some do. That'll be out in our new video we're getting ready to release called The Submerging Church. We're almost done with that. I know I've been saying we're almost done with that for two months now, but we really are really close. I think we have one or two little, well, never mind. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Isaiah goes on to add in chapter 53, verse 11 and 12, as a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear, and by the way, it's anaphero, same Greek word Peter uses in the LXX or the Septuagint, their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore, anaphero again, the sin of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Remember, he was on the cross. He interceded for the transgressors. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they do. This is all. I mean, the Bible is a radical book, guys. And we should be in it and, and studying it and, 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 and pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ, who did take away the sins of the world. But he bore our sins. And there were all kinds of pictures. Remember, on a resurrection Sunday uh, before, I actually brought a couple doves into the church service. And remember the sacrifice in Leviticus? It says to take one dove and put it in a, put it in a uh, 
a, a clay jar, put it in, in, a, in, a, in a clay piece of pottery, and then slay it, kill it, and then take a living dove and touch that living dove to the dead dove and so it gets blood on it, and they let it fly away. That was a picture of Jesus. Jesus is from heaven. He's the word that becomes flesh, just like we partook of this clay body. We're made from the dust of the ground. We have the same elements you find in dirt, but God gave us animation and life. And that bird was put in that clay pot. Jesus partook of flesh, and just as Jesus that bird was killed, innocent bird killed. Jesus died, the heavenly bird, the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, died in our place. Yet God had the living dove, what? Touch, identify with the dead dove, and it was let go as a picture of what? The resurrection, amen. The resurrected Christ. Now, I didn't do that, you know. We used a little grape juice picture of Jesus' blood, and we touched it and we let it go. Let the other dove go too, of course. You know, but Jesus didn't get let go. He had to die if we were going to be saved. He says the Son of Man must be lifted up. He had to die if we're to be saved. And there was also the scapegoat. The high priest would take his hands, he'd take his hand and put it on the head of the scapegoat and confer in the words, in his words, he would confer the sin of the, the Jews upon the scapegoat and it would be chased off into the wilderness. A picture of taking away sin. However, that scapegoat never really took away their sin. It was a picture of him who was to come, who would actually die in our place and take away our sins. Now, it's interesting because it's hard for the Jewish person today because what happened later is Maimonides, a Jewish, Jewish philosopher that lived in the medieval days, he, he drew a caricature of what the Messiah must be. And that's the acceptable caricature many Jews accept today. Yet he's way after the New Testament. He's way after many of the Jewish understandings of who the Messiah would be. And he's even after, you know, so much of the Talmudic literature, which talked about, and many Jewish scholars in the past had looked at Isaiah 53 as referring to an actual person or Messiah. In fact, I'm reading right now from, I'm going to read to you from the Talmud, which is a rabbinical literature that's accepted as authority in Jewish communities, okay? And this is by the, this is the Talmud from a rabbinic scholar Solomon Schechter. Listen to what he writes. The atonement of suffering and death is not limited to the suffering person. The atoning death extends to all the generation. This is especially the case with such sufferers as cannot either by reason of their righteous life or by their youth possibly have merited the afflictions which have come upon them. The death of the righteous atones, now check this out, the death of the righteous atones just as well as certain sacrifices. Isn't that interesting? Now, I'm going to say I totally disagree because we can't atone for each other's sins. The Bible is very clear that no one can redeem his brother. The Bible says that. Yet he, he knows there's a text in the Old Testament that speaks of someone sacrificing a man, a person, for sin. He's trying to deal with it. So he's looking at it as a general thing that maybe we atone for each other. Certain people that die young are atoning for others, which is not what the Bible teaches, but he is grasping that, a, that there's a sacrificial plan in God's heart and mind that goes beyond that of the animal. But we understand it too from Scripture to be that of Jesus. The death of the righteous atones just as well as certain sacrifices. They are caught or suffer for their sins of the generation. There are also, now check it out, there are also applied to Moses the scriptural words, and he bore the sins of many. Now he quotes Isaiah 53, he bore the sins of many, it's in the Talmud, and assigns it to who? To, Jesus, to Moses, wrongly. Because of his offering himself as the atonement for Israel's sin with the golden calf, being ready to sacrifice his very soul for Israel when he said, And if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of my book, that is, from the book of the living, which thou hast written. Now, he's saying Isaiah 53, in the Talmud, applied to Moses, of the one who would bear our sins. And then he quotes Moses saying, remember when they worshipped the golden calf, and God was, you know, he's blot me out of your book. And you know what? Did God accept Moses' sacrifice? I mean, this is so bogus. And the reason we know it is is because God didn't accept Moses. He didn't blot Moses out of the book. 
In fact, he says, all who have sinned against me in this will die. The very next verses. I think it's Isaiah 32, 32, and 33. The very next verses, he says he's not going to blot him out. And the people who committed sin in that are going to die. Moses never became that sacrifice. In fact, Isaiah 53 was written much later of what the Messiah would do. In fact, he goes on to write, This readiness of sacrifice oneself for Israel is characteristic of all the great men of Israel, the patriarchs and the prophets, citing in the same way, whilst also some rabbis would on certain occasions exclaim, Behold, I am the atonement for Israel. No, (laughs) we are not. No humans are the atonement for Israel except the Son of God. In fact, even the patriarchs, you know, even from Abraham onward, they looked forward to Messiah. You know, uh, David talked about his sins were as the number of hairs on his head, and he needed forgiveness, and he rejoiced in the redemption. Job, Job talked about how he knows his Redeemer lives, that one day he'll see him in the flesh, you know. And the gospel was preached ahead of time to Abraham. Uh, they wouldn't have need of the animal sacrifices if any kind of sac- human sacrifice had suffered back then. Amen. And there were no, in the Old Testament, there were no sac- human sacrifices spoken of as atoning for sin other than that of the suffering servant who would bear the sins of the people. And no, the suffering servant cannot be Israel in that context because the suffering servant bears the sins of the people. And all of us, the people, Israel, like sheep have gone astray, but he bore the iniquity of us all. He, the Messiah. But he's right. He's right about this. Isaiah 53 refers to a man. But when he picks Moses, he's just simply picked the wrong man. Amen? It says in in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. On the cross. And it's interesting. Please turn to Galatians. The book of Galatians. And uh, when you get there, go to chapter 3. Because in Galatians, we find a very... uh, When you get to Galatians chapter 3, I want you to go to verse... mm, We could go to chapter uh, 3, verse 10. And we'll read through 13. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse... For it is written, Curses everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. So Paul states here that whoever is trying to live by the Mosaic law of the Old Testament is under a curse. Then he quotes the Old Testament. Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all things of the law. In other words, if you don't keep the Jewish law, right, perfectly, you are under the penalty of death. I mean, what did it take Eve before the law came? Just breaking one of God's commandments, not to eat, right? Boom, she, death sentence, right, when she partook. And that's why they had the animal sacrifices in Israel, because nobody could keep the law perfectly. Everybody had to have atonement for their sins, the covering. Nobody could keep it perfectly. By the way, there have been no animal sacrifices in Israel since who? Since Jesus died. The temple was destroyed just before that. And then, I mean, just after that, Jesus died for our sins. They haven't had a sacrificial system for 2,000 years. How are Jewish sins being atoned for? Well, you know, they celebrate, you know, the Day of Atonement and, and doing good deeds. The Bible doesn't teach that doing good deeds takes away your sins. You can't sacrifice a new system for, and some Jews, they'll take a chicken and slit its throat and then they'll wave it over her head and fling the blood and say, this atones for my sins. There's making up new things. But in the Old Testament, it was a Mosaic law. You had to have those animal sacrifices to cover your sin. But guess what? For 2,000 years, they're not there. Because when Jesus was on the cross, he said, it is finished. He paid for it all. But we cannot be saved unless we put our faith in Jesus as our Messiah. So Paul says, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, who was having Christians put to death, who became a believer when the Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus. He wrote in verse 10, For as many as are the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide in all things written in the book of the law to perform them. And what does it say in Isaiah 53? Not of Messiah, of the suffering servant would die for us, but of, of Israel. All of us like sheep have gone astray. The iniquities of us all have fallen upon him. So none of them kept the law perfectly. They all had gone 
astray, as did all human beings. Verse 11, now that not one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by what? Faith. As Christians, we aren't saved by keeping a law. We're saved by Jesus through faith. Amen? Through what he did on the cross for us. Verse 12, however, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. In other words, you live, go by law. You're not about uh, pressing Jesus. You're trying to follow the Mosaic law. And you're never going to be able to live up to it. Now, in the New Testament, we're under the law of Christ. But that's not what saves us. It's Jesus that saves us through what he did on the cross. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us. Now, check this out. Christ redeemed us, saved us from the curse of the law, having become a what? Curse for us. There's imputation, guys. Our sin was imputed to him. He became a curse for us. For it is written... For it is written, check this out, cursed is everyone who what? Hangs on a tree. Jesus bore our curse. Jesus is the innocent son of God, yet he bears our curse for us. How is that? I mean, when they put king of the Jews up there, that was a placard, and you were supposed to put the, the crime of the criminal up there. And you would wear your placard in, in prison. They'd put, if you were in jail, they would put your placard up, and this is what you'd done. When they crucify you, they let people know why you were why they, why you're being crucified. And crucifixion, by the way, on a cross was reserved for the most heinous crimes. You couldn't crucify a Roman citizen. It was against the Roman law to crucify a Roman citizen. That was reserved for criminals who were slaves or foreigners. It's the worst kind of crime because they wanted to did not want to subject Roman citizens, even the worst Roman citizens, serial killers weren't weren't uh, assigned to a crucifixion on the cross. Because they'd spare their citizens the pain and the shame and the disgrace and the humiliation. But when Jesus went to the cross, what did it say? What did the placard say? King of the Jews. That's who he was. Son of David. Amen. Son of David. King of the Jews. And the kingly line. He died innocently. And he said, it is finished. Because what would happen is if you paid your time, let's say you, you did not commit an offense and it was, you know, usually you went to prison, you died. You were there to be killed. But it, sometimes you'd go to debtor's prison or whatever, and then they'd put tetelestai over your debt after it was paid. It'd be, say, paid in full. But every time there was an animal sacrifice in the Old Testament, they could never say tetelestai. It had to be every day, man, daily, right? When Jesus went to the cross and the placard went up, since he was innocent, he wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for our sins. He's being cursed for us. He said, tetelestai cried out, Tetelestai, it is finished, or paid in full, because he paid for all of our sins. He bore our sins on the cross. And notice again in verse 13, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Now, I think that's interesting. Really, really, really interesting. Because in the Old Testament, it says, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. Yet that's not how they killed you in the Old Testament times. How did they kill, put you to death in the Old Testament times? You'd be stoned to death. That would be painful too, but it would be over pretty quick. Unless you had a bunch of, you know, weak people throwing small rocks, then that would be really painful. It's like, get a big one, please, you know? But I'll tell you what. What they would do though, if your crime was particularly heinous, after they stoned you to death and you had done something incredibly wicked, then they would hang you up on a tree and let your body rot on a tree so people would see what you had done. In fact, then the birds would peck out your eyes as the flesh got soft. In fact, that's why in the book of Proverbs, it talks about a son who's rebellious to his parents. That, uh, and it talked about a, a son who is a drunkard, you know, and, and beats up his parents and what have you, that he was to be killed in such a way. Obviously, it's talking about an older son, one that's, you know, past the age of accountability, drunkard and everything else. And he would be put on a tree. And that's why in the, old, in the new, in book of Proverbs, it talks about the son who's in rebellion to his parents. He'll be like the son who has his eyes picked out by the raven in the valley, you see. Kind of interesting. Now, this is what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 21, verses 22 and 23. And if a man has committed sin worthy of death, and he is put to death... So notice he's already put to death. Then what happens? And you what? Hang him on a tree. See, that's what you do after you put him to death. This, his corpse shall not hang all night on the tree. 
but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of God, so that you do not defile your land, which the Lord your God gives you as inheritance. Now, if you were in Israel, you would bury him. If you weren't in Israel and you had a defector in the army, right, or what have you, that were a traitor or whatever, you wouldn't worry about defiling their land. It was already defiled. You just leave the body there. Now, it's interesting. This is all very interesting to me because this was written 3,500 years ago. Some years after that, it wasn't until hundreds of years after that. Now, Jesus, though, was crucified on a tree, amen? He was actually put to death on, on, on a cross, on a tree. And what's interesting about that is that's not how the Jews put people to death. Yet that's exactly what the Bible says would happen in the Old Testament when they were stoning people to death. The Bible says that Jesus, the Messiah, would be crucified. David speaking as a type by the power of the Holy Spirit, as he did many times. We have a portrayal of Jesus in Psalm 22. That's what we read in the first verses. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The words from Jesus from the cross. And then a little bit later, it talks about how they divided up my garments. What happened to Jesus? They pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. That's crucifixion, guys. And when that was written, guess what? Crucifixion. We have no examples in history of crucifixion taking place when that was written, of what would happen to Jesus. It wasn't until hundreds of years later that the Persians invented uh, crucifixion. Then when the Romans began to rule the world, a few stages after the Persians, they had perfected persecution or, or crucifixion to a T, literally. And they used it on Jesus. But the Bible tells us that curse everyone who hangs upon a tree and that Jesus would hang on a tree in a specific way that was to be invented later. This is prophecy, guys. This kind of stuff... It blows me away. It should blow you away. You know, it's not long before these things happened or even crucifixion existed. Yet Jesus became, and my main point is he became a curse for us. He died in our place. What an awesome God we have. Now, many of the Jews in the first century had different concepts of who the Messiah would be. In fact, if you go through the first century onward, you'll see them following different messiahs. Obviously, Jews had different beliefs. But, you know, I mentioned Christianity grew so much because it was rooted in what the Old Testament said about the Messiah. Now, it's, now granted, there are two different portrayals, not contradictory, but different portrayals of the Messiah in the Old Testament. One, as we've talked about before, is that of a suffering servant, amen, one who would die for the sins of the people. The other one is a triumphant king, warrior, and so some Jews came up with the idea that there will be two different messiahs. And they tried to understand and grasp this. But what, it, what the scriptures teach and reveal to us is that Messiah has one Messiah has two comings. In fact, we see throughout the Old Testament all kinds of pictures of David being rejected by his people, wandering, and Absalom is hunting him, right? running over the Kidron Brook, even as Jesus jumped over, or went over the Kidron Brook before he was sacrificed. Then later David comes back and reveals himself as king. Or Moses being rejected by his people at first, remember? Then in the wilderness for 40 years, coming back as the, the, the one that God would use to redeem them. You have this picture over and over and over again in the Old Testament of the prophets being rejected and then later, later being accepted. Jesus came the first time as a suffering servant, the Bible says, to pay for our sins. That needed to be taken care of. Otherwise, we couldn't be right with God. The second time he comes is what? The King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And even the Talmud, and we call this, the Talmud talks about, uh, and Jewish literature talks about Messiah ben David. Ben is son of. Messiah, son of David. And Messiah ben what? You remember? Now you remember that. Messiah ben Joseph. David was a king. And then Messiah ben Joseph. Joseph suffered. This would be like the suffering uh, Messiah. And they couldn't really grasp how this would work out. In fact, the Talmud says, and I think this is interesting, that this again is accepted in the Jewish communities as, as, as authoritative. Uh, and even though there's a lot of contradictions and they admit there's rabbis, all, you know, contradict themselves throughout. This is why it says, okay, check this out. If they, quote, and speaking of the people of Israel, if they are worthy of, speaking of the Messiah, he will come with the clouds of heaven. If they are not worthy, lowly and riding upon a donkey which is in Zechariah chapter 9. Zechariah 12, 10 talks about when he comes back, we'll see him whom we've what? Pierced, you see. The thing is, he comes back. He came lowly on a donkey already to take care of our sins. Next time he's coming in the clouds of heaven, amen. 
And that's the truth regarding Messiah and his, his, his bearing of our sins. Now let's go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And when you get there, verse 24, And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sin. And what? Live to righteousness. The word that, it's a purpose clause in the Greek. The word's hina. It speaks of a, a purpose. The reason he died for our sins. And notice it says why he died for our sins. Now when I say, if, if you ask somebody today in the modern church, why did Jesus die for your sins? They'll usually get it right, you know, so I could be forgiven. Would that be right or wrong? Be 100% right. He died so we could be forgiven and be made right with God. Yet, sadly, in the modern church, that's as far as it goes for so many professing Christians. But what's the purpose clause beyond him dying for our sins, which Peter already covers that. He paid for our sins. You know, it's implicit right there it's so we could be forgiven. It's obvious. But what's the purpose clause, therefore? What does Peter say that Jesus died for our sins? What's another reason, and the main reason that Peter highlights here? So that we might what? Die to sin and live to righteousness. So we might die to sin and live to righteousness, guys. When you think of Jesus dying for you, don't just think that so I could be forgiven. Praise God and worship him and praise him all day long for that. Happy is the man whose sins are not imputed to him. Amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Amen. Let's say so and praise God continually. But let us also remember that he also died for our sins so that we would die to sin and so that we would live for him, so that we live for righteousness. Amen. That's huge, guys. In fact, during the Reformation, when Martin Luther and the Reformers got an understanding that, wow, Jesus died for our sins. We don't have to pay all these stinking indulgences to the Roman Catholic Church to spring our loved ones from purgatory. It's a lie. Look, we've got the New Testament. We've got the Scripture. We're reading it, and the Bible spread. Martin Luther translated the Bible into German. The Germans started reading it and started going throughout Europe that, wow, Jesus died for our sins. It's not about purgatory and pain for our sins and, and indulgences and paying money to the church so we could get, you know, our relatives sprung from purgatory. It's about what Jesus did on the cross. Justification. Amen. We talked about imputation, right? Where our sin was accredited to Jesus and his righteousness accredited to us. There's propitiation we talked about. Propitiation. I went through a lot of these words with Jojo. So you could get it because he's young. Propitiation means payment. Payment to God in the New Testament context. It says in, in Romans chapter 3, verse 25, that he made the propitiation with his blood. The payment. So we talk about the payment that's been made for our sins on the cross, propitiation, imputation, his righteousness to be credited to us because he took our sins it was credited to him. Okay? Justification. Now we're talking about justification for a moment. Justification, praise God, is whereby, the process whereby we are made right. We're declared righteous before God through what Jesus did on the cross. Justification takes place. Jesus died, and therefore God no longer says guilty. Now it's not guilty, amen? We're justified. We're made right with God. But you know, there was such an emphasis on justification because they had missed it because of the dark ages and people didn't have the light of Scripture and the ages were dark. There was such an emphasis on being right with God through the blood of Jesus. There was almost a de-emphasis in the Reformed circles on sanctification, on the fact that God has called us to be holy and he saved us from our sins so we would die to sin. And that's why in the 1700s, not too long after the Reformation, there was John Wesley, Charles Wesley, and they saw that there was an emphasis in the Calvinistic circles of justification by grace through faith, and they said yes and amen. But they also saw this chosen, frozen mentality that we've been justified, and people just sitting around. There weren't a lot of missions going on. In fact, uh, very popular missionaries stood up and wanted to go on a mission with the mission, with, you know, with uh, the board he was addressing, and he wanted to go to on, on the mission field. Very popular incident. And the man said, when God wants to convert the heathens, he can do so all by himself. Sit down. He was told to sit down. And this man became a leading missionary in, in, the future, uh, in, in our past. Now, it's interesting uh, but that's missions. But sanctification took a huge hit. And the Wesleys regarded uh, sanctification as 
God wants us to be holy, you know? Without holiness, the Bible says no one will see the Lord. This is, if we're new creations, old things have passed away, and they realize a lot of people hadn't been born again, hadn't been justified, you know? Now, the emphasis on sanctification in the Wesley movement went beyond what I agree with personally, because they went into uh, what they call total sanctification, and uh, almost, a, you know, a perfection view to where, you know, you become practically sinless. Now, Wesleyans would say that John Wesley didn't teach absolute sinlessness, but he talked about walking in perfect love. And he talked about it. What, and when you read Wesley, sometimes you, re, you realize, okay, he's not talking about absolute sinfulness, sinlessness, but other times he seems to be. But you would, you would get to a point where there was a second work of the Holy Spirit, which they believe is the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to where you become holy. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches when we come to Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit, and sanctification is progressive, okay? And I praise God for John Wesley and a lot of what he's done. I can't stand his shadow. Praise God, but I'm just saying the view of sanctification, biblically, is when you become justified. Okay, what happens? The propitiation is made, right? Then when you come to Jesus and come to faith in Christ, then justification takes place. You become right with God, right? Because imputation has taken place through your sin being credited to Jesus already, but now his righteousness is credited to you, imputation, which brings justification. You're right with God. At that moment that you, res- that you get right with God, now you're cleansed of your sin, then there's regeneration. That's when Jesus comes to live in you. That's when you're born again, amen? And then you're regenerated. And at that moment when you're regenerated, okay, which happens almost simultaneously, right after, right, right after you're justified, then sanctification kicks in. That's where you become more and more like Jesus. You become separate from that, which is even more and more consecrated to God. Amen. There's a de-emphasis in the church today, guys, on sanctification. We always talk about how Jesus died for our sins. Why did Jesus die? So I could be forgiven. But so often, so, so few times you'll hear that he died to what? So that we would die to sin. He died for our sins so that we would what? Die to sin. Amen? Amen? That needs to be in our vocabulary. Sanctification needs to be in our vocabulary. In fact, it's throughout the vocabulary of the New Testament. We see it here in Peter. We see it in the Apostle Paul. In Galatians 2.20, Paul says, Through the law I died to the law that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and delivered himself up for me. In Romans chapter 6, Paul's coming against those who would turn grace into a license and say that we can just sin because grace abounds when sin abounds. So hey, let's just sin and then grace will abound. Paul says this, may it never be. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it. For he who has died is freed from sin. That's Romans chapter 6, verse 2 and verse 7. I want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. We're sorry we couldn't bring it to you in its entirety, but you can hear it online in its full content. 